Thanks everyone for joining us. Um, we have with us today uh, Anupam Jain. He is going to be talking to us type reification with PureScript. So we're looking forward to hearing about that. Thanks. Um, hi everyone. Welcome to this talk. Uh, let me just share my screen uh, and we'll get started. So yeah, so the title of my talk today is uh, it's PureScript Typeable, which is a library that I wrote for PureScript, which basically provides type reification. Um, and I'm gonna explain what that means uh, throughout this talk. Uh, but if you wanted to check out this library, you can check it out on my GitHub, which is uh, AJNSIT, and you'll find a library uh, with this name. So what is uh, you know, typeable? Typeable is a type class, uh, and I'm gonna be talking about that, but why do we need it? What does it do? So I'm gonna start with a motivating use case of a very real world problem that people might uh, encounter uh, and how does typeable help us solve that right so uh, let's say uh, you know you're building a database for a company uh, and it would look something similar to this right you would define all your data types each data type representing a particular aspect of your data model and uh, these are uh, you know uh, very nested data types so a company has multiple departments a department has multiple subunits and so on all the way until you have information about a person itself. Uh, uh, and the person uh, will have salary, name, address, those kind of things, right? Things that you might actually want to perform some operations on. So this, this is a very common situation that you're in, that you have this very deeply nested data structure and you want to perform some operation on a, a leaf of that data structure. So in this case, we want to do something like this. We want to give everyone in the company a raise. And we want to define a function called increase, which uh, takes a salary modification function, which is this salary to salary function. And it basically takes in a company and returns a new company, which has all these salaries modified uh, according to the salary modification function. So how would you write that? This is fairly straightforward. This is basic uh, Haskell programming, uh, but this is what it would look like. You, know, you would define for each uh, level in that data structure, you would uh, define um, uh, a function that would do this modification for you. Uh, and if you look at this, it's like a, a bunch of definitions. Uh, but if you look at everything inside this red uh, boundary here, uh, you would see that all it's really doing is that it's uh, going into the data structure and applying uh, this uh, modification function K recursively, right? So let's, let's look at this. So increasing the salary across company <clears throat> basically means that we apply this function, which is a department uh, modification function uh, on all the departments in the company, right? So it's just a map. Uh, then inc d is uh, a department modification function. It takes again a salary modification function and it returns a department modification function. Uh, and again, we basically go inside the department data structure and we apply uh, inc e, which is an employee modification function. <laughs> and an in queue, uh, which is a subunit modification function. Uh, and we uh, basically apply that. So we, we basically uh, keep on going, keep on drilling down into the data structure uh, until we reach uh, what is the meat of this entire operation, which is actually modifying the salary, uh, uh, which is right here outside the red boundary. So let's, let's focus on that for a little bit. Uh, so this is what uh, that function looks like. Uh, and it's just identity because uh, once you have a salary modification function, you know how to modify salaries. So this is the meat, the actual logic of what we wanted to do. We wanted to change a salary uh, when we already have a salary change function. Uh, but instead of writing this simple bit of code, we had to write all this rigmarole around how to modify salaries, right? Uh, if we were actually doing this in uh, an untyped, dynamically typed language, it would be very easy. Uh, we would have something like this. Uh, we would have something like this, but here we could just check if the value that we were trying to modify is a salary. If it is a salary, then uh, apply the function. Otherwise don't do anything, right? And that's uh, that would have been very easy, but because uh, we want uh, to do this in a typed safe way, uh, we want something like this. We want uh, to define a typed function that basically can take any type A and a salary modification function, and it gives us that type modification function, 
right? And this is what pure script typeable will allow us to do effectively. So this is uh, a motivating use case. This is one of the use cases that uh, pure script typeable uh, allows us. Uh, so let's let's look at some uh, some ways in which we could accomplish that, right? Uh, given the problem statement where you have a class of uh, types and you want to do something specific for each type, uh, you might automatically reach out for type classes, right? So you might define a type class called map salary, uh, where uh, you have an increased salary function, which basically takes a salary modification function, and then it returns that type modification function. Uh, so uh, before I continue on, uh, there's going to be a lot of code on these slides. Uh, and if you have any questions, uh, you can put them in the Q and A. Uh, and I would, if uh, I think something uh, needs to be answered immediately, I would answer it immediately, right? But otherwise uh, I'll continue on. Uh, so, uh, so you would define a class like this and uh, then you would define uh, an instance of that class for every uh, part of that data type, right? So let's say we wanted to define it for an employee uh, you would define it something like this. And it's a fairly uh, straightforward uh, implementation. You would uh, call that function, the salary modification function F. Uh, sorry. You would call that salary modification function F on um, every sub part of that data type. So you would call it on P, uh, which is a person. So you would change that person's salary. And then you would call it on every uh, 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 on the salary itself, right? And P is the personal data of that. Uh, and here we would also like to be able to handle cases where uh, uh, we don't have any salary information. So we also have a generic fallback uh, instance uh, where uh, for any data type, which we haven't specifically defined an instance for, uh, if you just pass that, uh, then the salary modification function does not do anything. Right, it would it keeps the data type as is. So this is uh, one way of solving this problem, but uh, and and uh, it will solve the problem in a very specific uh, use case where you want to just call map salary increase directly, right? If you wanted to call increase on a particular data structure directly, uh, and the compiler has all information about what that data type is, uh, then it can go through this instance uh, chain and figure out what to do or how to do it. But there are a bunch of problems with it also, right? Uh, and the problem is that we had to define an entire class hierarchy uh, for that specific function. Uh, for uh, we, we had to define an increase uh, salary function, and we had to define a specific class that only applies to that increased salary, right? So it's a lot of work uh, just to avoid some work, you know? So, so this uh, is just as much work, if not more, right? Uh, and uh, we wouldn't like to have that much boilerplate. Uh, what we would like to do is have a general solution where the uh, traversal through the data type is separated from the actual operation we need to perform on that data type. Uh, and we're going to look at how we uh, can do that. So this is the kind of thing that uh, we would like to do. We would like to uh, have a function which uh, takes a salary modification function, checks if the value that you were provided is of type salary. And this is not Haskell syntax. You can't just check for uh, types like this in Haskell, uh, because uh, all types must be known at compile time. Uh, and then, but let's say we were able to do that. Uh, and here salary represents the type salary. Uh, so if we were able to do this, that, you know, if A is an instance of salary, then just apply the function, otherwise return the function as is, right? So let's, let's try to write this. Uh, and here uh, is what the signature of that uh, function instance of would look like. Uh, it would take any type A and it would take something that represents the type of that A, right? Or, or some other type. Uh, and it would return a Boolean, which basically tells us uh, if it's, if that type A is, if that value A is of this particular type. Uh, and as soon as we know that uh, we write this, we know that we need something, some value that represents a particular type, right? To be able to uh, look, uh, to be able to perform this uh, logical operation, which compares the types of these two things, we need to represent types at the value level in some way. So what is that? So let's, uh, uh, so that's what we want to solve. Uh, and, uh, the standard solution for this in both PureScript and Haskell is, uh, something called a proxy. 
uh, where proxy is basically a value uh, that has a phantom type parameter, uh, which represents a type, right? So instead of, so if you wanted to provide type information to a function, you can pass in a proxy instead, right? And this usually works, but it doesn't work for our case because proxy doesn't have any uh, information at the value level. Uh, it does. So at the value level, it has only one data constructor uh, called proxy, doesn't have any arguments. And all the type information is at uh, the type parameter uh, level with a phantom type, right? So if we wanted to actually start writing this, we would be stuck immediately because we know that it's a proxy, uh, but there's no way to actually get the type, right? Uh, and we need to be able to get the type to be able to compare it with the type of A. The proxy doesn't suffice for us. Uh, we need something better. And in pure script, pure script is a language that compiles to JavaScript and it has very good FFI with JavaScript. So uh, a standard solution that I uh, tend to jump to is uh, just uh, punted to FFI, punted to JavaScript. <laughs> so so uh, you can define, uh, so we don't know what the type representation is gonna be, uh, but let's say that JavaScript, the untyped language has uh, that representation and it's able to somehow represent the types uh, of every uh, type in the type system. Uh, and uh, we are able to do a bunch of operations on it. So, so the way to do that in pure script is that you define a foreign data declaration. Uh, so we just say that there is some foreign data called type rep. We don't know what it looks like, but this is, uh, but we can just access it directly. So we define something called type rep. Uh, and then we need to be able to create values of that type rep. So we, uh, again, in a foreign uh, function interface definition, we define a function called type rep, which takes a proxy, which here represents the type that we want to create, and it returns a type rep for that type, right? Now the proxy A part of it is basically just to uh, let the type system know uh, what type we want, right? So it's, uh, it's not carrying any value at the type level, uh, at the value level, uh, but it's just for the type system. So we have a type rep, which basically gives uh, us a type rep for any type, right? Uh, so an example would be uh, defining a function called Boolean type, which gives us a type rep that represents a, the type of Booleans, right? And we would create it like this. We would pass it a proxy that is of type Boolean. Uh, this here is a pure script specific syntax uh, where, uh, and I think this would be valid in Haskell also. Uh, where uh, we basically want a proxy and the type of this proxy is proxy Boolean, right? Uh, but because this uh, data constructor uh, already tells us that it's a proxy, we just don't know what type of that proxy was. Uh, so we can omit the proxy uh, uh, type constructor here and we can just say that there's something of type Boolean. So this makes it slightly more concise and more pleasant to write. So it, to me, it reads like it's a proxy of type Boolean, right? But actually it's a proxy of type proxy Boolean, right? Uh, so yeah, so this is how we can define a Boolean type rep uh, by calling the type rep function. And then uh, we want to write instance of, right? So we, one way to do it is to have, uh, is to basically create a function called EQ type rep, which can compares two type reps uh, and that returns a Boolean. Right, so instead of taking a type uh, and a value and then comparing the types, uh, EQ type rep basically uh, compares two type reps and it tells us whether they're equal or not. Right, so here uh, to check if some value is uh, an instance of some type, let's say Boolean type, uh, we basically get the type rep for Boolean, right? Uh, and we compare it with the type rep of that type. Uh, so here, uh, this is how we are doing it. We basically, are given a value A and a type rep T. And we want to check if uh, the type rep T, the type of value A is the same as the type rep T. Uh, and we do that by ex first extracting the type rep uh, of that value A. So we get a type rep representation for that value A. Uh, and then we compare it using equal type rep. So this way, if we already had these functions defined for us and this opaque data type, uh, we are able to uh, come up with an instance of function like this. Uh, so this this could be our API surface, right? It's a very generic API surface, uh, which has just three simple things. It has 
a data type declaration that's opaque to us. The users cannot create new values of this type ref, except by calling the type ref function, uh, where we specify the type that we want uh, using proxy, and then it gives us a type ref, right? And the type refs that we get have this property that if the type uh, of A and B are the same, then the type reps of A and type rep uh, of B also have to be exactly the same. So if we have uh, type rep true and type rep false, they both should, should give uh, a type rep representing booleans and it should satisfy equality, right? So we should be able to just compare uh, uh, those two type reps and get true. So that is, that is important. And uh, we don't use uh, the Haskell equal operation for this. We use equal type rep for this. So, so the equality is uh, also an FFI function, which we use here, right? So it's, it can compare two type reps. And then, as I said, we can define instance of as a separate utility function, uh, which depends on EQ type rep and the type rep function. So this API looks pretty good if you can implement it in FFI and we can. So I'm, uh, you know, gonna go through the FFI bits of it at the end, but this is one way of doing it. Uh, but if you wanted to do it manually uh, in PureScript or Haskell itself, then we would do something like this, right? Uh, this is one way of uh, doing it directly in PureScript, uh, where uh, you basically create a data structure which enumerates all the types that are available to us, right? So you can define a data type rep which has uh, a, a constructor for integers, a constructor for characters, a constructor for array. And now we need to also know the type of uh, the elements of the array. So we have a type rep as an argument. Uh, then a function uh, takes two type reps because uh, the argument and the result uh, types also have to be specified. And similarly, tuple takes two type reps and so on. So we can enumerate all the types we have in the system. Right, and, and then we can write an EQ type rep function, which basically does uh, a direct comparison. So uh, if it's T int and T int, if you're comparing two T ints together, uh, it's they're obviously the same, so it can return true, right? So th there are some limitations of this approach, which we'll uh, get into, but uh, this is one way of doing it. You could actually implement this yourself. Uh, and then uh, uh, you want to create type reps. So with this manual uh, data type approach, one way of creating type reps is you create a typeable class, right? Uh, and then you can define instances for uh, each data type that you support. So uh, you create a type typeable class, which has a type rep function. Uh, uh, and uh, then you define an instance for integers. So type rep, uh, when called on integers, uh, will give me a T end and so on. You have to define an entire chain of these. Uh, this else thing might be confusing for people who are coming from Haskell and don't uh, uh, are not familiar with PureScript. Uh, PureScript has a feature called instance chains, where you can basically provide a bunch of instance uh, declarations to the compiler and provide an order in which they should be checked. Right, so you can de define something like uh, typeable int uh, else typeable a. So for any type, it can check if uh, if it's an integer, it'll call the first, and it'll use the first instance. Otherwise, it'll use the second instance. So, this is a very useful feature uh, for uh, resolving instances, right? So, given that, you can uh, easily create the increase function as we wanted. You just check if A is an instance of type rep uh, of salary. We want to check with salary, then do FA. Otherwise, just do A, and this will be a solution, right? Um, not, not quite because, uh, we immediately run into a problem, uh, at this point, uh, we have two branches, right? The first branch, uh, checks if the type of a is salary, but in the body of that branch, the compiler still doesn't know that the compiler still thinks that a is some opaque type that it doesn't know anything about, and it doesn't know that it's salary, right? So this particular check is uh, needs to be propagated to the compiler somehow, right? We know it uh, and uh, one way of fixing this and not really fixing it, uh, but one way of working around it would be to just unsafe coerce it because we know that they are the same. Uh, so you can easily uh, define a coerce to salary function which can take any value 
<laughs> can uh, unsafe coerce it to salary and then use that here, right? Um, and this is obviously unsafe, but uh, it's not any less safe than what you would do in a dynamically typed language, right? Uh, but this is not good enough for us. We want it to be safe, right? And that's uh, one thing that typeable allows us to do. So, so we're going to continue down the path of our manual type representation and see how uh, we can change that. So, uh, so what we really want to do is uh, at this point, when we do the instance of a uh, function call, instead of returning a Boolean, we want to return something that allows us to convert uh, type A into a salary, right? So instance of, uh, will only return true if A is the same as salary. So it only makes sense that when you do instance of, uh, it also returns us a function that allows us to do that conversion, right? Uh, and uh, let's call that a coercion, right? And this is known as a type witness. Uh, it basically says that you have performed, you have performed a, a value level operation, which uh, got the value of a type. Uh, and uh, you know that this type is a salary or a Boolean or whatever. Uh, now you also want a type witness that can tell the compiler that uh, this thing is true, right? Uh, so in this case, our type witness is a conversion function, uh, which converts A to salary. And if we had such a conversion function, we could uh, write it like this then, right? Uh, we can say that if instance of returns uh, a value, a conversion function, and we indicate that by wrapping it in maybe, so it can fail also if A is not a type uh, of the type salary. Uh, so if it returns a just, uh, then we also get a conversion fun function called coercion. And then we can just call F by first coercing it. Right. Uh, but if it returns nothing, which basically means that A was not of type salary, then we just return A as is. Right. Uh, so this, this would solve the problem. But again, uh, we start writing instance of, and we immediately run into a problem. Uh, instance of is supposed to return a function that converts a into salary but the arguments to instance of they don't uh, have salary anywhere right so instance of should have a type uh, a val it should take a value a it should take a type rep and the type rep here is entirely opaque it doesn't say that it's the type rep for salary that this we want to convert it to a salary right so it just says that there's some type rep uh, and if the type reps match, then it wants to convert it uh, into the value represented by this type rep, right? Into the type represented by this type rep, but it doesn't know what that is. So there's no way to actually write this function and have a type check. We can't just come up with a type uh, out of thin air, right? Which matches this type rep. So there's no way of actually writing this. Uh, to solve this, we do something which is uh, known as index type reps. Right. Uh, so until now, what we were discussing was uh, unindexed type reps, where uh, the type rep is just an opaque type without any parameters. Uh, but to solve this problem, to be able to carry the information of the type with the type rep uh, at a type level, uh, you basically add a phantom type parameter. Oh, it's not really a phantom, uh, not necessarily, because it's completely opaque. So we don't know what it is. Uh, and uh, we add a type parameter A which represents the type that the type rep represents, right? So, uh, so uh, you know, so uh, the type is now tagged with the uh, type itself. Uh, and uh, the API remains the same, except now we have these types coming along with us. Uh, so let's look at instance of. Instance of will now have two type variables, A and B. It takes a value A. It takes a type rep of type B. And then it returns a coercion function where a, and we represent this coercion with a tilde. Uh, so it returns a coercion function, which converts a to B, right? And ideally it should also return a function that converts B to A. If A and B are the same type, uh, then we can go either ways, right? So let's represent for, for now, we let's represent uh, that with a tilde. Uh, and uh, again, this, uh, comes from EQ type rep, which represents that type coercion, right? Uh, so, so this is why we need index type reps rather than just normal type reps. Uh, 
and uh, we haven't lost the unindexed representation because uh, uh, you can always use existentials for this. So type prep has a, a type parameter, but if you just wrap it inside an existential, uh, you can uh, get uh, an opaque type parameter uh, type which does not have a type parameter, right? Uh, and this is how you would do existentials in PureScript. Uh, PureScript does not have ex existentials built in, uh, and this is how you work around them, right? So a lot of this talk is about how you work around some things in PureScript. Uh, and uh, this is a library called PureScript exists, uh, which basically defines these definitions. Uh, and uh, this is how you would do it. So uh, it's just unsafe coercing it. It just forgets, right? Uh, it forgets what type it has. Uh, and then, uh, so make exists basically just the unsafe coerces uh, a type representation here. F would be type rep. So it just converts a type rep A into a, a sum type rep without a type parameter A. Uh, and then when we want to get it back, we still want to make it type safe, right? So we have this uh, higher order type here, which uh, it's higher order because it has a for all in the type. So what we get is, uh, a, so run exists as a function that can take, a, a, you can think of it as a callback, right? So it's a callback that can handle any uh, type A, right? So it, I, so it will basically uh, be given a type A and it can handle any type A, right? Uh, and it can give a value R and then we can return a value R. And because this is a higher order thing, uh, it's uh, the for all is uh, inside the type of the callback. Uh, it's not possible to misuse this. You can't actually uh, leak out the A uh, from the callback. So you can't, uh, uh, know outside this callback what the type A is, but you just know that it's some type, right? Uh, that you can handle. So this makes it type safe, and this is how you do existentials. Uh, and uh, you can recover the unindexed representation using this existential uh, act, right? And then this is what the API would look like for the indexed API, uh, where uh, type rep rep represents a type rep A. Uh, and here uh, you will notice that we have gotten rid of the proxy argument. Uh, we don't need it because uh, uh, the way you're using type rep, uh, just by the type of it, uh, li like here, we wanted a type rep of type Boolean, uh, or uh, so we will just say type rep is of uh, type rep Boolean, right? Because now the Boolean is a parameter to type rep. So uh, you can just say that. Uh, I expect the type rep to have a type Boolean uh, and you don't need to pass anything to it. And EQ type rep now takes two type uh, type reps, A and B, potentially different types, but maybe the same. And we don't know if A and B are the same type uh, and it returns a coercion wrapped inside a maybe, right? So we can use this coercion to convert between A and B. So this, this is what our API surface would look like uh, and we can represent it. So uh, if you wanted to uh, do the same thing using uh, our manual type representation, we'll have to use something called GADTs. Uh, with GADTs, you can constrain the type that you get from the constructors, right? So uh, now type rep has a, a parameter A. Uh, so our T int has to specify that this is not just a type rep, it's a type rep of int, right? So if we've constrained the type that this type constructor T int returns. Uh, similarly, tcar is a type rep of car and so on. So we have to tag all of them. Uh, and uh, then we have to implement EQ type rep uh, like this. But the problem is that pure script does not have GADTs. <laughs> so we can't write this actual code. Uh, but there's a very simple workaround where uh, instead of uh, using GADTs, we use normal ADTs. Uh, and we say that along with T, uh, along with the uh, type, the data constructor T int, we also carry again a coercion between int and A, right? So we are saying that it's any type A, but I am also carrying uh, uh, a way to convert any integer to A and any A to integer, right? So they are isomorphic. So effectively, this is the same as saying that A is an integer, right? And this is again our tilde, uh, which is a type coercion. Uh, so if you use those type coercions in our type rep, uh, we will basically be able to define this uh, in pure script. Uh, 
and this is just a handful of uh, constructors you can obviously extend it to as many as you need so for example you would need constructors for employee salary and all those things uh, to be able to use it in our example uh, and then we start writing our eq type rep using this uh, kind of a, a constructor right so here we have two t ints right uh, i a is a, a type coercion between integer and a and i b is a type coercion between integer and b and uh, we have to return a type coercion between uh, a and b right uh, so how will how will we do this we know that because both uh, type rep a is a t int and type rep b is also a t int we know that they are both uh, the same uh, because they're both integers but how do we uh, create that coercion between a and b uh, so this uh, requires us to uh, actually look at the internal structure of that coercion right so uh, a coercion is just an isomorphism as i said it has two functions uh, if we are saying a and b are isomorphic are the, they are the same uh, then we can convert between a uh, we can convert any a to a b and any b to an a right uh, so this is uh, so let's define a data type called same uh, it basically carries two functions a to b and b to a right uh, and this same happens to have a category instance uh, you can obviously define uh, an identity function for this which basically says that any type is equal to itself effectively it's saying that so uh, we, we can define a same aa uh, instance for uh, any type a uh, and our conversion functions are basically just identity which don't do anything uh, and we can also define uh, uh, this uh, category uh, composition function, uh, which basically, uh, if we, if we are saying that uh, we have a same A B and a same B C, which means A and B are the same and B and C are the same, then we also should be able to say that A and C are the same, right? And this is how you would write it. Uh, it's uh, pretty simple. So uh, the first same A B means that we have two functions A B, uh, which converts every A to B. Uh, and B A, which converts uh, B to A. And then similarly, we have a function that converts any B to C and any C to B. Uh, and now to get a function that converts from A to C, we we first go from A to B and then B to C, right? And similarly, when we have to go the other way, uh, when we have to come back uh, from C to A, we can first uh, go via B. So we can convert from C to B and then B to A. So this value that we create is uh, an isomorphism between a and c right and this falls pretty nicely out of this data structure that we created uh, so it's uh, uh, so we have these two uh, manipulation functions uh, and these are basically uh, kind of like proofs right uh, which uh, as i said id is basically saying that each type is equal to itself uh, which is the identity function that we just defined. Uh, and then we can define a symmetry function, which says, if you have, uh, a, if you have a proof that says A is equal to B, then you also have a proof that says B is equal to A. Uh, and it's extremely easy to define. Uh, if you have a function from A to B and B to A, if you just change the order around, then you will get uh, the uh, isomorphism between B and A, right? The other way around. Uh, and then we have the transitive uh, function, which uh, if we have, if we say A is equal to B and B is equal to C, then A is also equal to C, right? And this is the, just the function that we defined in the previous slide. So we have these tools that allow us to prove different things. Uh, and then using these things, we can uh, define our function, right? So here uh, we come back to the question of how do we define an EQ type rep with our manual type representation? Uh, so if we have uh, a T end, which has the isomorphism between integer and A, and we have a T end, which is, which has the isomorphism between integer and B, then we can get the isomorphism between uh, A and B by just composing these functions, right? So to go from A to B, uh, we first uh, go from A to I, uh, and then I to B, right? And uh, this is composed, so it reads the other way around. First we do A to I, uh, and then we do I to B, and we get A to B, 
And similarly, uh, if you want to go from B to A, then we first go from B to I and then I to A. And we have our conversion functions between A and B, A to B and B to A. And then we can compose our uh, same A, B like this. Or using the functions, the manipulation functions that we defined earlier, we can just say, uh, if we have a proof that integer is the same as A, and we have a proof that integer is the same as B, then we have the proof that A is the same as B because uh, A is the same as I and I is the same as B using our transitive proof, right? So uh, we can compose these two things together and uh, we don't have, uh, we were not given uh, A is the same as I, we were given I is the same as A, right? Where I is integer. Uh, so uh, we just use sim uh, symmetry to invert the type arguments. So we can just say that if you know uh, integer is the same as a, then a is also the same as integer. And then we can, we have the arguments in the right order to compose uh, these two things together. So this is an example of how you would uh, manipulate the proofs that you're already given into the proof that you actually need, right? And you can define functions like this for all types, for all the data constructors, like the integer is here. You can define it for any uh, type that you want, right? Um, so yeah, so this is, again, we'll have a class typeable, uh, which will, uh, be defined for all types that you need. So for an integer, uh, our proof will just be identity, which is this identity is the, uh, categorical identity that we defined earlier, uh, which is this one. So it's basically, uh, same identity, identity, right. Uh, and then, uh, we can define it for array by again, just doing identity like that. So we can construct type refs, uh, typeable instances like this. And now we have uh, uh, a way of writing this function. Uh, we will say that uh, first we check if A is instance of type rep. If it is, then we got a coercion, right? And the coercion is that same data type that we defined. And uh, recall that the first uh, parameter here is a conversion from uh, A to what we what is our desired type. So A to salary. So this coercion is from A to salary. So we can just coerce it to salary and then we can apply F on it. Uh, and if we uh, got a nothing back, that means that A was not of type salary, then we just return A as is, right? So we can define uh, this function finally like this. Uh, an alternate API for this would be defining a cast function instead of a type checking function like instance of or EQ type rep. We can also uh, define a function called cast. And the cast is basically a way to take any value A and maybe convert it to B. And the way it does it is it first checks if A is the same type as B uh, by doing an instance of. And then uh, if it is, then it just converts it, right, uh, by using the conversion function. Uh, and then we can write our increase function in, uh, I think slightly nicer way using cast. So we try to cast it to salary. If it is a salary and we got a just, so here N is a salary now. So we can just apply the function F to it. Otherwise we just return A as is, right? So this is a slightly nicer API. Uh, the typeable uh, library provides both cast and EQ type rep and instance of. So it provides all of these functions. Uh, so we have been working with the, the same data type, which is here, uh, but the library actually does not use this. Uh, the library uses something called Leibniz equality. So I'm gonna uh, go over that uh, for a couple of minutes. Basically, uh, instead of having two separate conversion functions, A to B and B to A, uh, Leibniz equality states that uh, for any context F, you can convert from FA to FB, right? So uh, you have A wrapped inside some context, you can convert it to a B wrapped inside the same context. And this is just a single conversion function, but uh, it's of the same uh, power as that isomorphic uh, isomorphism that we defined earlier, right? Uh, but it's a lot more flexible and a lot easier to work with because it's a simple, uh, single function. Uh, so we define our Leibniz uh, data type uh, like this, and we define in a type alias for this also, use the tilde. Uh, and then we define a run Leibniz function, which basically unwraps the Leibniz 
uh, and gives us this conversion function back, right? So if we have a Leibniz uh, equality between A and B, then we can convert it any uh, A wrapped inside the context F to a B wrapped inside the same context F, right? And it just unwraps. So this is what it actually uses. Uh, there's a library called PureScript Leibniz that does this. I think that's what the name is. Uh, and again, uh, Leibniz is a category, uh, but you will see that the instances are much easier to write. Uh, so Leibniz, because it has a single function, so it's Leibniz, uh, the identity for Leibniz is just identity, right? If you have an FA and A is the same as B, then uh, you don't need to do anything. You already have an FB. Uh, and uh, composition is just, again, function composition. If you can go from FA to FB, and you can go from uh, FB to FC, then you, if you just compose those two functions together, you will go from FA to FC, right? And that's what Leibniz is. A lot easier to write uh, instances for. Uh, and uh, this is the proof. Anupam, we, you, you've got just a couple of, couple of minutes left. Sure, sure, sure. I'm just going to quickly wrap it up. And this is the proof of how uh, you uh, know that this is the same expressivity because um, you can convert a Leibniz equality, uh, a Leib data type into a same data type, right? And uh, you can just look at it. Uh, this is how you derive it. So you know that they are the same. Uh, and I'm just going to skip over this. And finally, uh, we come to the a solution. We hear uh, this, this is a technique called scrap your boilerplate, which basically uh, generalizes over traversals over recursive data types, not recursive, nested data types. Uh, so a GMAP T is like a generalized traversal over any data structure A, which uh, uh, so using this, we can define a function called everywhere. Uh, which can apply uh, a particular function to all leaves or all uh, stages of an nested data structure, right? Uh, and when we pass it our uh, salary increment function, uh, we basically get what we want, right? So this will take a company or any data structure which has nested salaries inside and it would increase salaries everywhere, right? So this is a general way of writing it without having to go into uh, specific uh, nested traversals, right? Some other use cases uh, for uh, uh, typeable is, uh, for example, you can have dynamic types, so the dynamic values. So uh, you can, uh, uh, the way it's done is basically, you basically have a data type that uh, both has an A and the type of A wrapped up inside an existential, right? So uh, uh, the type does not actually specify the A, Part of it, uh, the type uh, just has the context T. Uh, but uh, when you match over the existential and you get the type rep out, you can use the type rep for comparisons and figure out what the type of A is, right? Uh, and this is the way you do it. You basically pass it an expected type. You say, okay, I have a dynamic T. Uh, is it if is it a boolean, right? And if it's a boolean, it will give me a just with that boolean value. Otherwise, it will give me a nothing, right? And you unwrap it and you. Uh, check if they are equal, and if they're equal, it does the coercion and returns it, right? Uh, another way, uh, another use case is serialization, deserialization, where uh, you basically store the type rep itself. Type reps can be serialized. So you store the type rep, uh, you serialize it with the value, and then when you read it, you can check, okay, I was expecting an integer, and the type rep I got was a Boolean, so types don't match, right? So you, you can have errors. Let me show you an error. So here we uh, get the deserialized type rep out, uh, and then we compare it with uh, the expected value. And if it didn't match, then we can throw an error which says expected type was this, which was the type rep that was passed. But I found something else, which was the type rep that we actually read from uh, the serialization. So yeah, so this is the library. Uh, the library basically makes it extremely simple and safe uh, to create type reps. You don't have to do this manual representation thing. Uh, because that's unsafe uh, uh, and it's not very extensible. So the library basically just says that you can define your own Tacti instance. Tacti is a class that uh, the library provides and it's a very manual instance. So, and it, the compiler also makes it impossible to get it wrong, right? You cannot write an invalid instance for this. Uh, it will not compile. So you just define an instance like this and it will automatically generate a type of blue field. Uh, and it does it using FPI hacks that I'm not gonna go into right now because we don't have time. 
but basically it makes it very safe to actually generate typeable uh, and type ref uh, for types. So yeah, so this is the FFI stuff. I'm not gonna go into it, but this is the library. Uh, please check it out and I'll be happy to take any questions. Thank you so much for sharing um, about this with us today, Anupam. It's been uh, lovely to, to hear your insights.